Good evening again. For good evening for those of you who are in Hong Kong and good day to others who join us from elsewhere in the world, including Rob Hawkins from UK. Today we have nearly 160 people sign up on the program and we have friends from Italy, Germany, Japan, Macau, Hong Kong and China mainland. Welcome you all. I think you are muted. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can everyone hear me well? <laughs> so let me try again. So good evening for all of you. Um, good evening for those who are from Hong Kong. Good day to our speaker, Rob Hawkins, and those of you who are joining us today from elsewhere of the world. We have nearly 160 people signed up today from Italy, Germany, Japan, Macau, Hong Kong, and China mainland. Welcome to you all. I'm Idi Wong, serving the Sustainable Living and Agriculture Department of Kuduri Farm and Botanic Garden. I'm the facilitator today. So today's talk is uh, part of KFBG's unfolding new initiative and the initiative named Kuduri Earth Program. And this online talk series started on Earth Day April this year with our teachers Satish Kumar guiding us to see the Earth as a living organism, Gaia. Then we have Dr. Stephen, Stephen Harding as our teacher in May. And he led us to bring science and myth together as a way to experience reference for life. So today we are very delighted to have Rob Hawkins here to share with us inspiring stories from a different angle, which is from community-led change from around the world. So we are hoping that all these sharings will provide us knowledge and inspiration, guiding us through a journey of care to shift towards an ecological center worldview, to rekindle our connection to the earth and all living beings in a time of increasing challenges. So let me introduce our speaker today. Um, I think some of you are very familiar with this name, Rob Hopkins. Rob is a very well-known permaculture teacher, and he's also the founder of Transition Time Toughness and Transition Movement. He's also the author of several books, including the Transition Handbook, and most recently, From What Is to What If. He also hosts a very popular From What If to What Next podcast. Lecture rightly, um, and he's also involved in several very pioneering initiatives in his own town. He is also once one of the Britain's 15 new radicals. I recall Kaduri Farm's first interaction with the transition movement happened in year 2008. Some of you may have joined um, the very inspiring workshop which was organized at that time. So this movement initiated by what has first started at Totnes in UK. And two decades from that time, now it is spreading worldwide to over 50, 50 countries today. So today Rob is going to share with us his journey from being a permaculture teacher to founding the transition movement, the stories of community-led changes from around the world, explore the transition model and how it come about, and also his current focus on the creation of imagination infrastructure, which is intended to inspire more imaginative communities. So before we move on, here is a few logistic reminders. So today we will first have Rob sharing with us for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a chance for question at the end. So please think about your questions throughout the talk and you are invited to share your question in the chat box when the Q&A session is open. So hopefully we can also um, let you to ask the question directly. So to assure we have a good sound quality throughout the session, please keep your speaker mute during the talk. But I would invite you to have your camera on at the beginning and during the Q&A session so that we have a stronger sense of togetherness with each other tonight. 
So here's a tips for those who are less familiar with Zoom. You can choose to have a bigger view of the speaker by choosing the speaker options at the wheel button on the right upright corner of the Zoom window. And the gallery option will provide you a broad view of other participants who uh, will be shown up in uh, small icons individually on the screen. And also please be, be reminded that this webinar is being recorded. In case if you have technical problems during the talk, please send us chat message to the host and we will help you through. So um, now let me, um, Please join me to welcome Rob, and um, we are looking forward to your wonderful presentation. So over to you, Rob. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you all. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you today from uh, Brussels in Belgium, uh, where I've been for a couple of days. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen because I want to show you some pictures. I'm going to be telling you some stories, but I'd like you to be able to sort of see some things as well. So I'm going to start with this and I'm not sharing you this as a graph because nobody needs a graph uh, in the evening, but I want to sh I'm sharing it with you to imagine that this is a, a picture of a mountain and that in the global north we have spent the last 150, 200 years climbing up this mountain and in 2022 I think we kind of stand up on top of this mountain and some people, not many, have the most spectacular views that humanity has ever experienced from the top of this mountain. But the, And beneath our feet, there's more debt, more inequality, more plastic, more carbon, more anxiety than we've ever stood on top of before. And the guides who were with us who know this mountain really well, are pointing to the very dark storm clouds moving very, very quickly in our direction and saying, we need to get down off this mountain really, really fast. And uh, for some of us, that's, that's enough. That's all we need, right? They're, they're the experts there. They know the mountain. But for many, many people, that doesn't seem to be working. So the idea that, I, that is going to run through what I want to share with you, and which has really run through all the work that I've done over the sort of 20 years that this presentation is going to cover, is what if instead of trying to terrify everybody uh, that we need to move, or if believing that if we could just give people the most terrifying DVD about climate change anybody ever made, what if instead we told the stories of the lower part of this mountain? of the valleys at the bottom, and we could bring alive in people's imagination how that would be, the food and wine that waits for us there, the warm firesides, the comfortable mattress, uh, the dry socks that wait for us when we find our way down off this mountain. Because then our work is not just about trying to find the most skillful ways to give everybody bad news and bad information. It's about the cultivation of longing. How do we work in such a way that we are able to cultivate longing in people for that future? And that is the work of imagination and storytelling and creative teaching and all kinds of different things. And that's what I want to really explore with you today. So I'm going to, I've, and this is a, I've never pieced all of these things together in a presentation before. So this is the first time I've done this, but I guess what I want to share is, is how my ideas and thinking have kind of evolved uh, over time. So when I was about 22, I did a permaculture course and I had become very interested in permaculture. Somebody had given me a copy of the big uh, designer's manual for permaculture, Bill Mollison's book. And it had a, and I opened this book and, and it was talking about earth repair, this concept of earth repair, the idea that we could piece back together the ecosystems that we have destroyed and that actually human beings could live in a relationship with nature where we're enhancing it and building it rather than just destroying it. And so I did a permaculture course in 1992 and it, and it rewired my brain. It did something extraordinary to me where it meant that rather than walking around and seeing the world as it is, I was able to see the world as it could be. I would walk down a street and I could see all the lawns 
as gardens, all the walls as potential growing space, all the roofs as potential solar uh, power generating places. And, uh, and it was a really uh, a, a very kind of uh, important shift for me. So I then went to university. I did a, a sustainability degree, which thank God I'd studied permaculture before, because otherwise it would have been massively uh, depressing way to spend three years. But I was the one in the class going, oh, oh, maybe we could, maybe we could, you know, bringing, bringing sort of solutions into that. So I moved to Ireland in 1996 and I started teaching permaculture. And in 2000, I went to have a meeting with the man here in the picture at the front, a man called John Thulier, who ran an adult education college uh, in a town called Kinsale. And I went to see him because my friend Belinda, who you can see on the right in this picture, was the drama teacher at this college. And she said, and I said, I'd love to do a, a, like a, a full-time permaculture course somewhere. She said, go and talk to John. John was a real radical within the Irish education system. The Irish education system is generally very conservative. I went to see him and said, John, I've got this idea. I want to do a permaculture course. And he said, what's permaculture? So I had to explain to him what it was. And then, uh, and then he said, I said, I'd love to do a course that runs here. And he said, how many people do you think we'd, how many people would come? He said, right, we'd need 14 to make it viable. The first year we had 40 people, we had 25 people. Every year after that, we had about 40 people and we had to close the course for bookings before the other courses had even had any bookings. It was hugely popular. And it was a course where we'd spend some time in the classroom and we spent a lot of time outside just doing things. So it was very applied. It was an amazing opportunity to design the permaculture course that I would love to have studied. So we planted with the lawns around the college disappeared very, very quickly under trees and shrubs. Uh, we built a building. Uh, from straw bale and cob as a as a natural building experiment we used hemp plaster in our classroom uh, to make it warmer and more beautiful we in the last year i was there we built did an extraordinary project where we wanted to do something that would bring together the permaculture students the sculpture students and the drama students. And my friend Belinda, who you saw in that picture, had been to London and seen the Globe Theatre, the rebuilding of Shakespeare's theatre. And she said, I'd love to have uh, something like the Globe Theatre. And so I said, okay, we'll build you the like a, a version of the Globe Theatre. So over a year and a half, we built a theatre using all materials from within about three miles uh, of the town. Uh, this was my students at the end of the first year. And, uh, and the second year. And we built this amazing theater with local wood, with local clay and straw and local stone. And the, just before I left to move back to England, we had the opening night of the theater. It was one of the most magical nights of my life to have built this uh, extraordinary thing with all the students. And they did a Shakespeare play uh, on that stage. And, and for me, that first stage of, of permaculture was such a, was, was just wanting to inspire people with, you can do this. It's not that difficult. Uh, and, and to demystify a lot of the things that needed to happen. Around that time, just before we finished building the theater, I had my, my kind of uh, climate change, dark night of the soul, which I guess all of you will, will have had. And which is, a, which is the moment when you really understand the scale and the urgency and the severity of this crisis, and um, and it was it was a and, and and so for me at that time I had been reading an amazing book that David Holmgren, who was one of the people who created the permaculture movement, had written called Permaculture Pathways Beyond Sustainability. Amazing, amazing book. And what he did was he said permaculture design principles are the principles that we need in order to create a low carbon future that's that, that they are the design principles for the 21st century in that context and and it was it was it was a real light bulb moment for me because i felt like i had spent up until that time uh working in the permaculture movement in ireland that had this philosophy of you need to buy some land and build a house and and work in that kind of a way and i remember looking around at the permaculture movement around me and thinking right okay it's a climate emergency come on permaculture movement 
let's scale all of this stuff up and and uh, and, and and transform society. And I looked around me, and most of the people that I knew in that movement actually were happier off up a little lane somewhere making chairs out of sticks. Do you know, it's like people wanted the world to change, but they also didn't really want to engage with the world because they didn't trust it very much. And so around that time, I moved back to the UK, having lived in Ireland for 10 years. The last thing I did when I lived in Ireland was I set my students, uh, my second year students, a project. I said, OK, let's imagine that in this town of Kinsale, uh, we were to intentionally plan a pathway to move away from our oil dependency so that in 20 years time, we were in a better place than where we are now. And, and so I would give two students, look at food, another two students, look at energy, look at education, look at transport and design a kind of 20 year journey by which we did that. Around the end of term, they all handed in their projects. I thought, these are amazing. These are so great. This, this needs to be shared. So I wrote a little introduction. I designed it and made it like a little book. And we called it the Kinsale Energy Descent Action Plan. Uh, when I left to move back to the UK, it was presented to the town council who gave some money to support it. But more importantly, I put this online and by the time I'd moved to England, it had been downloaded 7,000, 8,000 times. People all over the world saying, oh, this, is, this is the piece we've been waiting for. This is a really important piece of this conversation. Like, what, how do we do this? And how do we do this at, at the community scale? So I moved to Totnes uh, in Devon, which is where Schumacher College is based. I started meeting different people who were interested in this kind of thing. Some of them had even already heard of it. And we started for the first eight or nine months it was really just a series of conversations. And then in September 2006, we launched something that we called uh, the, we called it the official unleashing of Transition Town Totnes. And we expected maybe 100 people would come. About 350, 400 people came. And there was a lot of energy and, and dynamism around this. And we designed it uh, to be self-organizing. Here's a, here's a structure within which you can do amazing things. We've set up a bank account, a website, a newsletter. The infrastructure is here to support you. Bring your passion and bring your ideas. Uh, and so very quickly then there was a food group that started exploring food project, projects, an energy group exploring energy projects. And it started to really build a momentum. And at that, at that meeting already, that unleashing event, there were people there from six or seven other towns, even from outside the UK, who had somehow heard about this. That something interesting was happening. Uh, and then they went off back to their places and started this as well. And very quickly, people were writing to us and saying, how do you do this? And we would say, we have no idea. We're making this up as we go along. And uh, the following year, I wrote a book called The Transition Handbook, which tried to kind of capture what is this thing? Uh, and then Naresh and Sophie, who uh, Edie was saying, uh, traveled around the world, came to Hong Kong and, and set up a, a pool of trainers, uh, really helped in, in terms of defining what is this thing. Uh, but it's it spread and it spread. And as Edie said, it's now in 50 countries around the world, in thousands of places. And every couple of years, we go back to that movement and say, what are you doing? How's, how's that? How's it working? What's, what, what are you doing? And uh, uh, so we did that recently. And from that snapshot of the movement in 2021, we created this series of what we called characteristics of transition. What are people actually doing? What does this thing look like? What do people uh, set out to actually achieve? Because the thing I love about transition is that it, it is not like a Coca-Cola franchise. If you, were, if you were a control freak, trying to uh, support something like the transition movement would be absolutely terrifying because people just go and they do things and you trust them and extraordinary things happen. Uh, so what I wanna do is just to pick some of these characteristics and use them to tell you some stories about what the transition movement actually looks like. So the first one is engage with the need for change. So we, we live, all of us live uh, in towns or cities, apartments, universities. We have a community around us who often don't necessarily understand the urgency of the situation that we're in. So a lot of transition involves 
uh, education of the people around us, showing films, giving talks, and trying to uh, engage people with change in, in a way that has a different quality to it. It's kind of an invitation to be part of uh, making history. You know, I always say to transition groups, imagine that we, if you do a, a launch event, that a few years later, that's going to be celebrated as this extraordinary moment in history that started something that was deeply transformative for that place. This is an event in my town that we did just before COVID, if anyone can remember life before COVID. Uh, this was an event that we did, which was uh, where we invited the community to come together to, to, to really think about, well, what, what are we gonna do about, about climate change? These events don't happen unless we as communities make them happen. Uh, and they need to be really well facilitated. The second one is about co-creating, to co-create motivating and imaginative narratives and visions. And I'll talk a bit more about the imagination work I've been doing afterwards, but there's something really powerful that community groups can do when they harness that. So this is a story from London in a neighborhood called Tooting. And Tooting doesn't have anywhere that's like a, a village green, a square, a, a sort of a people's, a space for people to meet. Uh, it just has a very busy high road and lots of shops. There's one place where that could happen, which is here, which normally is just reserved for buses. And the buses wait here to be called to go somewhere else. And they leave their engine running and the air smells terrible and it's just not great. So one day, a couple of years ago, the transition group crowdfunded about £2,000. And then for one day, they made all the buses go away. And they turned that space into what it would be like if it already was that village green kind of space. So they filled it with flowers and coffee and carnival and conversation and colour and the, and the real diversity of that community. They put real grass on the ground so that I could sit there and feel under my feet what it would be like if that space uh, was a green in that way. And what was most fascinating, because I spent all day there from, from when they set it up to when they took it all down, was to notice how the conversation changed. So at the beginning of the day, people said, well, if this was our village green, da -da 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 -da. in the afternoon, people were saying, when this is our village green, da -da 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 -da. so somewhere underneath, like the, the tectonic plates of permission started to move. And people started to talk about the wall here, which, you know, if there was a competition for London's most boring wall, this may very well win. And people were saying, when this is our village green, what story do we want to tell about ourselves? What story will we paint uh, on this wall? So when you are able to mobilize a community and bring imagination into what you do, it's a very, very powerful thing, I think. The third one is about care. And we live in a society where our governments are providing less and less care and uh, where we're seeing this rise in the epidemic of loneliness, mental health crisis. And so there are many ways in which transition groups are providing that care that otherwise isn't being provided. This is in Hungary, uh, where the transition group there took over this building to turn it into a community resource. And during COVID, this was a really important place uh, where people could meet in a, in a socially distanced way, but it was a place that was safe and was theirs. And it provided a really important uh, a community piece for people. This is uh, in Pasadena in Los Angeles, where the transition group there run a repair cafe 13 times a year. They say, you can bring anything to our repair cafe. We have NASA up the road there. We have Caltech up the road there so you can bring your ipad your smartphone your shoes your curtains your dress someone will repair it free of charge but there's one condition which is that while they repair it you sit in a chair opposite them and you tell them a story from your life tell them a story about your life so i always think what are they really repairing in the, in, in, in the transition Pasadena repair cafe. Um, this is a, a project in Wales where they noticed that there was lots of perfectly good food being thrown away every year by local shops. So they started a cafe where they would turn that food into affordable meals for, uh, for local young people. And, um, 
and then uh, and create jobs and training opportunities for local young people. Sorry, I thought you'd frozen there for a moment. Um, uh, and this is a, a farm in the north of England that was run by the local authority and they decided they were going to close it down and sell it. So the community bought the farm and they run it as what they call a care farm. So they run it to provide the services that local government stopped doing. And it's all based around food growing and food preparation. People learn to cook, people learn to grow, people learn to look after chickens. And it's a, been a really important uh, community piece of, 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 of well-being infrastructure and care in that community. And this is another project in Italy that's doing much the same. So many transition groups have that ethic of care that really runs through what they do. And another part of, of this that's really important is what we call inner transition, that we recognize that uh, thanks to initially to the input of, of Sophie Banks, who we mentioned, and to Hilary Prentice, who really pioneered this idea of, of inner transition, who came very early to see me and Naresh and said, this is only going to work if it has a, a, an inner component. If we recognize that the scale and the urgency of change that has to happen is not just about solar panels and uh, organic carrots, it's about how do we support each other through these times? How do we work together in such a way that we can make decisions, that we can reduce the risk of burnout, that we can be resilient as people through this process, uh, that we can have groups which, which model a different culture, they model the culture that we need to create. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm in Belgium and the Belgian uh, transition uh, network has a really strong uh, uh, support in a transition support uh, group. Uh, in my town, we have a few initiatives that have been really transformative, I think. One of them was this idea of mentoring. So anyone working at the heart of the transition movement uh, in Totnes can at any time access free support from counselors or therapists uh, whenever they need it. For me, at certain times, when things have become very stressful or kind of really overwhelming, having that kind of support has been really precious in terms of re reducing the risk of burnout uh, during this process. So, uh, so this, this inner transition approach has developed many tools, many resources, many trainings, and um, now Transition Network as an organization which supports this movement uh, has embodied many of these things through uh, becoming a, a flat, we completely redesigned the, the, the structure of the organization. So we're now at use holacracy and are a, and are a flat structured organization, uh, which requires the building of a whole new culture of trust and how people work together. And the roots of that really very much are in this emphasis on, the, on inner transition. A lot of transition groups very actively address injustice and see their work as, as trying to tackle many of the big problems that we have today. This is Cooperation Humboldt in the US, who are very explicit that their work is about decolonization and, uh, and um, sort of gender equality and, and economic fairness and so on. And this is one of the projects they do where they work with low income families and they can mobilize a lot of people. So if there's a low income family who really want to be able to grow food but aren't able to do that, then Co Cooperation Humboldt will mobilize many, many people to come and over a weekend build a food garden for them and support them in doing that. They also do a lot of work in solidarity with indigenous people uh, in, their, in, in, in their area. So for that, they're a really beautiful example to me of, of what happens when you bring transition together with a more kind of radical uh, decolonization uh, perspective. And this is a project in my town, this is me about 10 years ago. And uh, this was, uh, this is a, a project that I've been involved with for 14 years now. But for me, it's one of the biggest sort of projects tackling injustice where this is an old factory in my town it used to be the biggest employer it was a milk factory that employed 160 people it closed in 2007 and all those people lost their jobs and we started a campaign at that point for the community to become the developer on this site and we spent years trying to persuade the landowner to take us seriously they didn't in the end they did in 2014 uh, and um 
after we had campaigned really hard, and this is a picture from that campaign, uh, to believe that we could do that. Uh, and then when we, we signed a partnership agreement with the owners that we would get planning permission, that we would run the community consultation, we would master plan the site, and then we would buy it from them. And we ran a consultation in a town of 9,000 people that heard from more than 4,000 people. It was quite extraordinary. We master planned the site based on what the community said it needed. This is a completely different model of how development can work. Usually development is big money coming in, identifying a site, designing a scheme that means they can extract the most profit from it and the community around are just left with whatever it was and they get no input. This we genuinely said, anything could happen here. This is a blank piece of paper. Anything could happen here. And uh, we got planning permission through, uh, through a referendum, through legislation that said communities could do that. And uh, you may have heard that people in the UK aren't very good at referendums, but we had a, we had a local referendum that, that where 86% uh, of people voted for this scheme to go ahead. And then just as we were about to buy it, we were, we were told that they'd sold it to a private company instead. So can you imagine? So we're now campaigning really hard to get the site back. This is a photograph from a big event we did at the site where we projected things onto the buildings. Another world is possible. And we're working very hard to get this back and we will do, I think, by next year. But it's for me, it's, it's such an important injustice project because um, this will all of the housing in this scheme will be truly affordable for to meet local housing need uh, and the beautiful thing is that it'll borrow the money to build it but it'll borrow the money over 25 30 years but it's a scheme that will generate a lot of money through rent and income from different things and that after 25 years when it's paid off the money it borrowed it's generating two or three million pounds every year that normally goes off to big developers, but would stay in the community and the community would decide what to do with it. Imagine how that model would work where you are if there had been several developments that had happened there, which generated that kind of money every year. How different would your community's sense of what's possible be? How different would the response to climate change have been, to COVID, to all of these different things, if, if development worked in such a way that it supported us rather than just robbed, uh, robbed us and the community around us? Applying living systems design, this takes, back, takes us back to permaculture and, the, and this idea that we look at nature and we learn from nature and we base what we do on nature. This is in Luxembourg where in Luxembourg, the transition movement in Luxembourg is, is, is really well supported and funded by the government. They employ about 19 people in the, in, the, in the transition network in Luxembourg, which is three times more than is we have in transition network to support transition all around the world. You know, and it's, uh, and it's phenomenal. One of the things they're doing is building an earth ship, which is a huge building built using old car tires, uh, built around ecological principles, so it stores the heat uh, using a lot of local natural materials. It's an extraordinary uh, thing, which, which will now become an education facility for people to come and learn those principles. Um, sometimes when we talk about principles uh, from nature, we talk about positive feedbacks, particularly in, in terms of climate change. You know, this idea that the, 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 there's more sunlight, so more ice melts, so there's more dark water, the dark water can warm up faster, so more ice melts, and it's called a positive feedback, although it's really not actually very positive. But what we see in transition sometimes is, is actually this same spirit of positive feedbacks, but happening in a positive way. So this is a transition group in the southwest of England who started a community garden, just they got two pieces, little bits of land, they started a garden, <clears throat> lots of volunteers came, they really enjoyed it. Then somebody said, oh, there's this long strip of land behind some houses over there. What could you do there? So that it was covered in rubbish and, and, and weeds. So they, with volunteers, they cleared that space. They consulted the neighbors. They turned it into a food forest, really successful. Then their local council said, we've got this eight acre um, piece of land here that we don't know what to do with. Could you come up with some ideas? So the transition group ran a big public consultation. They used empty shops on the high street. They came up with this design, which is now being implemented. And then earlier this year, the council said, we've got a 39 acre <coughs> uh, 
uh, corridor around the side of the town. Uh, what could we'd like to turn it into a green corridor? What could you do with that? And I think, wow, all of that's in about four years. If I went back in 10 years, what are they going to have done? You know, because you do one thing. And I think often we, we imagine there are people over here who don't know anything about climate change and aren't doing anything. People over here who know a lot about it and who are doing lots and lots of things. And that somehow if we can give people some sufficiently terrifying piece of information, they're going to magically jump from here to here. And that's not how it works. It's more like people are here and they need to take a first step in. And when they take that first step in, they go, oh, that was fun. And I know loads of people I didn't know before. And I, and, I, and I strangely feel a bit more hopeful about things. Maybe I'll take another step. And so you need to be creating projects that people can step and step and step and feel more and more uh, empowered with each step that they take. One of the best examples for me about taking this sort of uh, applying this sort of living design ideas comes from Liège in Belgium, where I am today. And Liège is a, is, is a sort of medium sized city, a former industrial city. And in 2014, I went there and the transition group had come up with a question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of the food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? Such a beautiful question, and it, and it's that kind of uh, it's you know, that that's how in natural systems it works. You know, you, you you're working with what's around you. So, I went there. They did a big event where they invited everyone in Liège who cared about food, and loads of people came. About six hundred people. They ran it as an open space, and then I went home, and then I didn't hear anything. And four years later, I went back, and in that time in Liège, inspired by that question, they'd started. 27 new cooperatives. They raised 5 million euros of investment for those cooperatives, not from the banks, not from the municipality, from the people of Liège investing in those businesses. I met a guy who had started a, a cooperative vineyard and they had raised two and a half million euros to start a cooperative vineyard. I said, how did you do that? What, what made you think that that was going to be possible? And he looked at me a bit puzzled and he said, it's Belgium, people like wine, people have some money, don't be afraid. So I, I, I really took that advice to heart. He, he said, we had a good story. We had a good narrative. We had something that people wanted to be part of, that they wanted to support. So now in Liège, they have a farm, two vineyards, a, a brewery. They started this shop called The Small Producers in the center of Liège which uh, did so well, they opened another one. They now have four of these shops. This is now the model that the municipality is using to reimagine how it provides this food for its universities and schools and hospitals. I met the mayor of Liège who said, this is so exciting. This is the story of the future of our city. We used to say we wanted to be a smart city, but now we want to be a transition city. This is, this is what we want to do. And our role is to remove all of the blockages and, and all of the obstacles to this happening. And what I, uh, uh, what's so inspiring, I think, about what's happening in Liège is that that idea is spreading. There are now six other cities in Belgium who are adopting this same approach, and many in France. I went to the city of Marseille on the south coast of France, a huge city on the south coast. I met the mayor there who said, we're buying land all around Marseille now to build a new model for how this city is going to feed itself. This is happening. You know, big companies like Sodexo, who just, who just take the contracts to provide uh, cheap uh, school meals for people. They're the story of the past. And this is really the story of the future. Uh, but it started with a really, really good what if question is very important. Another principle, uh, another characteristic that we see is that people take practical action. They get on with it. They don't sit around and talk about ideas. It's not like a philosophical thing. It's a, it's a I'll see you next Saturday. You bring the spade, I'll bring the trees. And this is in uh, here in Brussels on this street. This is in a, in, in, in a neighborhood uh, with a lot of prostitution and a lot of men who drive up and down the street all night and it's quite antisocial. So the council closed the street here. You can see the concrete blocks uh, in the front of the picture. And uh, the community said, could we make a garden? Could we make a garden in our street? And so the council gave them the materials 
and then the community built it. Now, this is a small, small little garden, right? This isn't going to feed one person on the street, certainly not going to feed the street. But what people found was this was their first experience of working together with other people. This was their first experience of wanting to spend time in this street. It became a street before that nobody would really walk down. It became a street where children could play because if someone was working in the garden, then the children were okay. It was a really, really transformative uh, thing for that street. And so many projects in transition are like that. This is in Brixton, in South London, where the community group started their own energy company. Uh, called Brixton Energy, and they would they would invite local people to buy shares, and then they would put solar panels on the roofs of, of the poorest housing blocks uh, in that neighbourhood. And um, the, the first time they did it, most of the people who invested were kind of middle class, white, kind of eco people. By the third and fourth time, it was the people who lived in these blocks who were investing because they could see the benefits. They could see that it was a good, a good place to invest their money. They could see it was giving young people something to do. It was making their apartment more energy efficient. You know, this is people step up and create things in all kinds of different ways. In my town, we started something called Transition Streets. And the idea of Transition Streets is how do we support the people around us to use less energy, use less water, and so on? What do we do? How do we do that? Governments have been wondering that for a long time. Do we send them a DVD in the post? Or, like, how does that work? So Transition Streets is designed as a program where you form groups of six to 10 neighbors. You meet seven times in each other's homes. So you get to meet each other, people open their doors to their neighbors, invite them in. Um, in my town, we ran this in about 2011, 2012, 550 households took part. Uh, on average, they cut their carbon footprint by about 1.3 tons a year. The national average is about nine tons. So they saved about 600 pounds a year from the measures that they did with this. And many of the groups carried on meeting afterwards because they enjoyed each other's company so much. And many projects emerged because they just carried on meeting. What was fascinating to me was that after, after they had done it and they were surveyed, nobody mentioned the carbon. Nobody mentioned the money they'd saved. Everybody said, I feel part of my community. I feel more connected. I feel safer. I feel like if I have a problem, I know who to go to. And when COVID hit, arrived a few years later, the WhatsApp groups that they had created for Transition Streets became the template for how they organized to support each other during COVID. And the beautiful thing about a movement like Transition was that Transition Streets, a tool that was developed in, in, in my little town in the, in the southwest of England, uh, was picked up and adopted for all sorts of places. There's a US version of it. There's a, a Belgian version. In Australia, uh, Transition Streets has been run in many different places. Uh, so these kind of things, when you come up with a good idea, they can spread really well. This is uh, two different towns next to each other in Australia who were doing uh, Transition Streets, meeting, meeting up to share their experiences and to share their ideas. Um, this, which was, what were we talking about here? Oh yeah, take practical action. So this is uh, um, Extinction Rebellion, which is a movement that my wife is very, very involved with and I have, a lot of, I have a lot of support for. She's very, very involved. She's been arrested, I think, seven times now as part of Extinction Rebellion. I'm very, very proud of her. And in April, 2019, they occupied this bridge. This is Waterloo Bridge in London and they turned it into a forest. So for those two weeks, they managed to hold the bridge and stop the police taking the bridge back and they turned it into a forest. Normally this bridge is cars going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And uh, for two weeks, it was quiet with trees and people would cross the bridge and stop and say, oh, why, why can't it always be like this? You know, so there's something, I, and I like to think of this as being a pop-up tomorrow. You, you, you take the world of today and in there you give people a taste of how that future could be. You know, practical action can take many different uh, um, forms and it can be more con confrontational sort of direct action uh, alongside this kind of community led change as well. Broadening and deepening participation. How do we make sure that when we do transition in our community, we're working with 
uh, the broadest sort of uh, reflection of that community possible. So in Tooting again, who, who are in South London, who are a really good example of this, the way they work is just beautiful. One of the things they did was they took over an empty shop and they turned it into what they called the Tooting Transition Shop. They said it was a shop with nothing for sale, but lots on offer. And the idea was it was a place that you would just drop into and, and there would be questions. So what do you love about this place? What are your fears for the future of this place? So there was no agenda. It was just a space for people to come in. It was really creatively facilitated. And, uh, and it was a beautiful way of, of, of interacting with a real diversity of people in that neighborhood. They did an event when they started where they visited all of the places of worship of all of the different uh, faiths in their community and heard from them, well, how, how do you talk about care of the earth? And so they've very actively been building over a long time relationships. And they recently created this, this map of, of all the relationships they'd been building and then the projects that that led to. And what I love about transition is that it's, it's like, it's not a linear process. It's not like if you do A, B and C, you will get D. It's more like you inoculate your local community with a mycorrhizal mushroom culture and it spreads and you can't really control it you might have an idea of some places it might go sometimes it will fruit in places you expect sometimes it will really really surprise you and it was lovely to see this how they started to map the connections the relationships transition is fundamentally about relationships and about stories and about how we build these kind of uh, these these connections and, and we're hoping to do a lot more of this to get transition groups to try and really map how those relationships have mattered the last one is just about energizing networks and alliances if you start a transition group you can't do everything yourself however much you engage people and however much you do we need to build relationships out with other organizations in toronto transition toronto do a project called tree mobile where they have uh, they, they offer to the community to buy uh, fruit trees and nut trees, but then they, the idea is that they then get delivered to the house uh, in a cargo bike, and then someone will plant the tree for you. And they work together with lots of different organizations to make that happen. Uh, and they plant trees with lots of organizations who don't have a lot of money, but who, who are, want to be part of that as well. So over the years, they've built up this amazing network of organizations that they work with. And that's a really, really powerful thing. And this is something called Municipalities in Transition, which is working across Europe now uh, and further afield, I think, which is about trying to capture the stories about what does it look like when bottom up community activism meets local government? How do we when that works together well, like in Liège, it's beautiful and it's really, really powerful. But often you might have a municipality who are really serious about transition and there's no transition groups or you might have a really active uh, community groups transition and other groups and a municipality that just really don't care so how do we how do we design that what can we learn from best practice so if you have a look at the municipalities in transition website there's lots of really good case studies there of what this looks like when it works well and when it works successfully because we need to do a, a lot more of that um, this is in, in, in Bath, where they started a community energy company uh, from two transition groups coming together. That transition group runs regular calls for community investment, and they've created a model where people can move a percentage of their pension into uh, locally owned renewable energy. They've now raised about 15 or 16 million pounds of investment from local people and then the, from their local uh, government to install renewable energy all across the city of Bath. And we need these models where rather than putting our money in the bank, we put our money into something that's going to be really transformative to that neighborhood, which is owned by the community, which is democratic. So we get to be involved and part of learning more democratic processes. These things are really, really fundamentally important. So I've gone on this journey then from being a young permaculture teacher inspired by that, getting to a point of thinking, Okay, how do we take these ideas of permaculture and mainstream them much faster? Because one of the other challenges is if somebody in the pub says to you, Rob, what's permaculture? 
it's really difficult. You have to get a, you need a flip chart and you need to start drawing chickens and arrows and orchards. And it's kind of a complicated thing to explain to people. What we wanted to do was to create something people could just go, oh, it's that transition thing. It's like building a, a Trojan horse. You know, we, we kind of built a Trojan horse that you can put inside permaculture, the work of Joanna Macy, uh, different things like that. And that you could just wheel the Trojan horse and people would say, oh yeah, it's the, it's transition. And, uh, but inside it are all those permaculture principles in its DNA. And I'm always intrigued when I meet people who've been active in transition for years and never studied permaculture, who then decided, maybe I'll go and do a permaculture course. And then said, I know all this. So I've never studied it before, but I somehow I know it, or I've, I've, I, I get the basic of this because it's, it's kind of in the DNA of it. So after being involved in transition and it spread for all this time, uh, in about 2000, in about four years ago, um, I found that I kept reading people like Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein, people I really respect, uh, uh, Amitav Ghosh, who were saying climate change is a failure of the imagination. I kept reading this phrase, climate change is a failure of the imagination. It kind of got under my skin. I was thinking, what does that mean? Like, why would we, is it really, could it really be the case that actually our collective imagination, which should be a muscle like this, has actually become a muscle like this at the very time in history when we have to reimagine everything? And as somebody who had spent the previous 15 years trying to inspire people to reimagine everything, that felt like a really important question. So I spent about two years doing the research for, for what became the book From What Is to What If. Um, and I love this statement that, the, that is on the front of the Institute for the Future in America. Any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. And I'd spent years with people considering me completely ridiculous. You know, when I went to, when I said, oh, I was to a permaculture course, when I said, uh, when I first went to see the mayor in Totnes and said, I've got this idea for this thing, we're going to call it Transition Town. She was like, that's completely mad. And, uh, uh, but actually, it's the ridiculous ideas that are the most important ones, because we're now in a climate emergency that is so urgent that, that we have to be thinking really big and really bold. And many of the stories that I've told you already are things that when they were first presented would have been considered crazy. This is a picture I love from America in the 1960s, when if you went to the beach, you parked your car on the beach. Everybody is what everybody did. So sometime in the early 70s, it must have changed that people said, it would be a lot nicer, wouldn't it, if you could go to the beach and it wasn't covered in cars. And so they changed that. But you can guarantee that at that time there would have been people who said, I can't imagine going to the beach and not parking my car on the beach. I've always parked my car on the beach. You know, but actually, things change really fast and we need to, we need to keep that, that possibility open. The other, the other thing I love about this photo is how slim everybody is. I don't think it would look quite like that uh, uh, these days. But change happens really fast. It took 10 years from Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery to the civil rights legislation being passed in America. It took 10 years from the first international sanctions on South Africa to the new constitution being passed there. It took 10 years from the first iPhone being released to more than half of the people in the world having a phone. Things are accelerating and changing. This is a factory built in 1941 in the United States. They built this factory from scratch in six months. And when it was open, they built one of these airplanes with one million working parts, one of these airplanes every hour. When we decide that we want to act like this is an emergency, things can change incredibly fast. And we have to, we have to hold on to that belief that, 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 that is possible. The problem we have, and I found some research that suggested that actually our imagination has been in decline since the mid 1990s. It suggested that IQ and imagination rose together until the mid 90s, at which point IQ kept rising and imagination started to fall. She said that was due to the decline of play in our culture, to the rise of screens, and to the rise of testing in our education system. But I worry, as Mariame Kaba, who's an incredible prison abolition activist in America, puts it, that we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. That unless we create the space 
in our movements, in our organizations, to have the conversations, to reimagine things, it's not going to happen. And so what I wanted to do with the book was to put imagination back in the center of the table and say, this is really important. What happens to us as a culture if our imagination just de declines and declines and declines and declines? It's a really, really frightening thing. So the work that I do is about, as I said at the beginning, how do we cultivate longing for that future? We can do it through art. This is a guy called James Mackay who draws the future. His drawings are just beautiful. He says, what if the city you lived became the most biodiverse city it could possibly be? Well, maybe it could look like this. We could do this in 10 years if we could cultivate the longing to do it. As we take more and more cars, out of our cities. What do we do with that space? Maybe we fill them with gardens like this and our children walk to school through gardens like this. This is absolutely possible that we can do this and it would be profoundly transformative, I think. So just to, before I finish, just a couple of things to share. One of them is I was really curious to find out what would it be like to, like if our collective imagination is shrinking through I think a really complex, perfect storm of factors if it started to grow again how would that be what would it feel like to live in a time where we reversed that trend and so i went to dundee to visit in, the, in scotland to visit a project run by this amazing woman called rosalie summerton it's called art angel and they work with people with mental health problems with burnout and they say when you come here you're not a patient you're not a client you're an artist and you are preparing work for an exhibition. And every year in Dundee, they put on an exhibition in the biggest gallery in Dundee. And I spent a day there. People were really happy to tell me their stories of how they had just had a complete collapse and now they were starting to come back. And it was beautiful. And every year at Art Angel, in order to evaluate how well they're doing, they give their artists a piece of paper with two silhouettes of a human body. And they say, fill the first one, to show how you felt before you came here. And the second one, to show how you feel now you've been coming here for some time. And how has this place changed you? And I want to show you one of these because it really moved me a lot. So when I look at that picture, firstly, I see what it feels like when as human beings, we reconnect with our imagination and we rebuild our imagination. Secondly, for me, this is the picture that gets me out of bed every morning to do the work that I do. Because I've seen again and again and again that when people feel empowered, when people feel part of making change happen, when free people feel part of the community around them, that, that there's something amazing that happens, that their, their belief in what's possible changes. And if we are going to do what the climate scientists tell us that we need to do, in the next 10 years. We have no choice. We can't negotiate with physics. The scale of the cuts that we need to make in terms of CO2 is huge. We can either say, oh, that's not possible, or I can't imagine that, or that I, I, it's, it's not possible. Or we can say, right, okay, let's do that. Let's, let's embrace the possibility of that. In which case, the next 10 years will feel like we had lived through a revolution of the imagination an extraordinary time when anything felt possible and things moved really, really fast. And that's what this picture captures for me, how extraordinary that could feel. So the very last thing I wanna share with you is this. In, in, in Totnes, where we started the transition movement, one of the first things we did was we created a local currency called the Totnes Pound. We said, we're gonna print our own money. And if people know one thing about Totnes, they know that we're the town that printed our own money. It was a story that was in the media all around the world. We just, we just decided to do it. And it ran until about four years ago. It stopped uh, about four years ago, basically because people stopped using cash. We became a sort of a, a plastic card society and most shops never saw any cash. But for 11 years, we had our own money and it was beautiful. And we, we had a 21 pound note. People would come to Totnes and they would say, why have you got a 21 pound note? And we would say, because we can. Why not? And what I love is that this has inspired many places across France and Belgium who have local currencies. And I go to places that have a 39 note or a 13 note. And that kind of playfulness of, well, we can do what we like. In Liège, they have a zero note. I said, why have you got a, why have you got a zero banknote? 
And they said, oh, you know, because sometimes someone will do something nice for you and you want to say thank you, but you don't want to put a number on it because that feels a bit strange. But you want to give people like a, a token of your appreciation. And so they have a zero note. You know, so this change that we need to make could be such fun and, and more like a party than a protest march. And it could tap into that, that what it feels like when we play together. And I feel like if we get it right, the next 10 years could be the most extraordinary period in time. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And if you want to find out anything else about what I do, robhopkins.net is the blog that I do. If you want to find out about the transition movement, there's loads of resources at transitionnetwork.org. And as, as Ed said at the beginning, I do a podcast called From What If to What Next. And uh, that's a really nice place to continue exploring these ideas. So thank you so much for your attention. And I really look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing all this positive story with us and also the huge encouragement for us to reimagine and imagine um, what our future could be. So now it leaves us to have 30 minutes um, taking questions. And if you have any questions, you can send in through the chat box. And if you want to write in Chinese, it is also OK. And um, we have a few questions sent in already. So um, let me pick this one. It is sent in from um, Sarah B. Um, she's seeking a clarification on a few works and also um, holacracy, holistic, holacracy. I think you mentioned about that phrase um, during the talk. So she wants to understand a little bit more about uh, the concept of it. Well, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so holacracy is a um, is a way of or of, of creating organizations that, that don't have a hierarchical structure. So it's based on the idea of it's a it's a different governance model that that we spent a couple of years being trained in how to do as transition network. So rather than having people uh, in jobs, you have you have circles and you have a heart circle and uh, you make decisions using a process called decision by consent. And it's a, it's a really fascinating way of working. There's, a, there's, there's some good books on this idea of holacracy. I think for us, it was a really important part of um, our journey as an organization that we started out supporting the transition movement, but in a fairly conventional we had a we had a kind of a director and then people in charge of different things and then other people doing different roles around that uh and it felt like we needed to model the kind of change that, that we were talking about and so it's been quite an amazing journey in terms of learning a whole new culture about how we work together it's a lot more based on trust and uh and, and deep listening and uh where there's an organization here in Belgium who are called the uh, Université de Nous, which means the University of We or the University of Us. And they are extraordinary at how they support organizations and train organizations to make this shift. There's, there's one thing called holacracy and there's another thing called sociocracy. And we're a kind of a bit of a mixture, I think, of the two. And I'd, I, I, I'm not sufficiently an expert to, uh, to, to pick the differences apart between what they are. But, but um, if you look into holacracy, you'll find out a bit more about what that is and how it works. But it felt really important for us as an organization. So Transition Network was formed to support the movement. So initially, we, whatever power there was, we, we held that power in the center. Uh, so if somebody in uh, Rome wanted to start a transition group, they would come to us. But then we've created now in 26 countries what we call a national hub. So there is Transition France, Transition Germany, Transition Italy. Then they take, we, we delegate that to them. So as an organization, we were set up ultimately with the aim of giving away any power that we had. And then now within us as an organization, we, we, we're using holacracy to try and do that as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Rob. Um, here we have another question from Bonnie Chen of Hong Kong. Um, she is saying that talking about transition is quite practical and ideal for saving the earth. 
just wondering if there is any more tangible suggestion that might enhance the possibility the probability of transition happening in Hong Kong, since Hong Kong is quite a result and benefit oriented city, people could do a quick calculation before doing almost every single things. So she would like to have your advice, please. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Well, I've, I've, I've only ever been to Hong Kong once when I was about 19. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you know much more about it than I do. But I, I think one of the things that I notice in um, because I try, I so I don't fly. I stopped flying in in two thousand and six. So I only travel on the train. So I travel all around Europe and I visit many different places who are doing this work. And one thing I notice is that everybody always believes that everyone else is going to be better at this than they are. So if I if I go to Italy and Germany and France and in my French talk I say, well you know here in here are some stories from Italy and Germany. People always say, well it will never work here. And then you go to Germany and people say, well, of course, it'll work in Italy and France. It'll never work here. And then I go to a city and people say, well, of course, it'll work in the in the rural area, but it would never work here. And then in the rural area, they'll say, well, of course, it'll work in the city, but it'll never work here. So it's like, so what what a version of, of transition for Hong Kong would look like would be would be its own its own thing. You know, in, in London, there are there is no such thing as transition London because your head would explode because London is just too enormous. So, but there is transition, there are 50 different transition groups in different neighborhoods all across London who work at the neighborhood scale. So most cities uh, feel often like a collection of villages, you know, that, that, that you, you come from a particular part of the city and that's, that's the scale to start at. And then to see, uh, you know, it really helps if you have a local government who, who who are concerned about climate change so that you can formulate something you can take to them with, that they will see as being a solution as well. Um, uh, also increasingly in the transition movement, we've seen this move towards, um, uh, towards starting to think more um, kind of entrepreneurially about the projects that we do. So, so rather than thinking, well, we're going to start something that will depend on volunteers forever, we say, okay, we're going to start something that's, that's a new piece of infrastructure that this place needs, but with a different business model. So in my town, I'm one of the people who started a, a brewery here. We make very, very good beer. If you, if you ever come to Totnes, you're very, very welcome. And we could have started that as a kind of community volunteer brewing project and making beer and giving it away which would have been nice too but actually we're now a business that employs about 12 people who can pay their mortgage and who can feed their family and we did a different model where rather than borrowing from the bank we borrowed from the community so we have 270 owners we're the first 100 percent community owned uh, brewery in the uk so so bringing that way of thinking is really really important too I think the, the, the first place to start is to bring people together. You know, we, we started in Totnes with lots of big open space events and just to see what are people passionate about? What do people see as being the changes that need to happen? What are the needs that aren't being met? And is there a skillful way that those needs could be met, which also works us towards um, transition? I'd also recommend on the transitionnetwork.org website, there is a free guide that you can download there, which is called the essential guide to doing transition. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe Juliana, you could find it uh, and just put the link into the chat. It's if you go to transitionnetwork.org and go down to the bottom of the page, there's a link there. And I think there's a Chinese version of it there as well. It's in about 15 different languages. So have a look at that. That's a really good sort of distillation of the experience in 50 countries of, of how to get this um, started. But, you know, for, how, what it would look like in, in Hong Kong would really need to come from, from people in Hong Kong, I think. But there will be, so there will be some things that we can do in Totnes that would be really hard to do in Hong Kong, but there will be other things that you can do in Hong Kong so much better because you've got so much higher density of people and you, know, you, you could develop a critical mass to support projects a lot quicker than we can uh, in, a, in a small town. You know. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rob. Um, we have to turn our problem to solution. The population is a problem, but it could also be the solution. Yeah.
So here we got another question from um, Edward, um, Edward Chen, um, probably from also from Hong Kong. So what is the most useful criticism to the transition movement you have ever encountered? And how did you, how did the movement, how did you or the move, movement react to that criticism? That's a great question. <laughs> I think I think we've we've had lots of different bits of criticism over the over the years, and often my job has been to be the person who re, who kind of responds to to, to the kind of criticism. Um, a lot of it, I think, often is really people using transition to 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 sort of support their own ideas. You know, it's it's more about them than it is about transition. It's not really based on, on, on understanding transition. I think probably the most useful criticism of transition is that is that transition often can be a, a kind of more middle class, uh, sort of less ethnically diverse movement. And 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 uh, you know that's it's it's there's a certain amount to that that is that, that is correct but only i think to the same extent that it's um that it can be said of the environmental movement as a whole you know most environmental movements tend to be like that and i think that's partly because people have more time people have sort of skills to volunteer and that people have a life experience that says if you try and change things, things might change, which is a lot, not a lot of people's uh, experience. So, um, so there's a lot of work in the transition movement now about, like there is in many movements, I think, you know, about trying to really do the work that we need to do ar around diversity and around inclusion. And, you know, we've organized, the, the last couple of years, we organized two big online summits, one called the What Next Summit and one called Together We Can, which was in May this year, to really consciously uh, broaden and, diver and diversify the voices who, who, are, who are coming into the movement and the stories that we're amplifying. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, I mean, it's a long, it's a life's, it's a life's journey, but it's, it's, it's something where I feel like another key part of that is that if, if we imagine that we're going to make change on the scale that we need to make change and in the time that we have available, and if we imagine we're going to do that all with volunteers, then you are always going to end up with a middle class white movement. And I, I was recently part of, a, of, an organ, of, of an event with a woman called um, Daria Robinson from Richmond in California, which is a really quite tough place. And she, she runs a project there teaching young people to grow food. And she's done it for 15 years. And every year she produces a new cohort of people who've learned to grow food in that neighborhood. And we did an event together and she said, and so I said, you know, I said, what we need to be doing is creating work for people. You know, the projects that we're doing need to create work. It's, what, it's, it's why the cooperative movement grew so fast, because it created jobs for people. And she said, it's really good to hear you say that, because if this is a revolution that depends on volunteers, then I can't be part of it, and nor can anyone where I live. So there's a big strand of transition that we call reconomy, which is trying to help people to... Um, think of their projects as through an entrepreneurial kind of way of looking at it. So one of the things that we do in Totnes every year, I love it, it's called the Local Entrepreneur Forum. And in the Local Entrepreneur Forum, um, you have four or five different people who present their idea for a business they want to start, and they ask the community to support them. So it could be by investing money. It could be by giving them professional support. It could just be by giving them some advice before they go and talk to the bank manager, whatever. We've now got 40 new businesses that exist in our town because this process has been set up to support them. So I think there's that part of it as well. You know, we need to be, we need to be creating jobs for people. Good, good quality work for people is going to be a big part of that too. Great question. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, very good question. Um, so we also have a question from Foreign Tattoo. Um, and the question is, how do we consign the logic of collaboration in the transition movement and the logic of confrontation that seems to be 
effective in radical politics. Um, what I find really interesting is, is that often when I go up to big Extinction Rebellion actions in London, about a third of the people that I meet there say, oh, hi, Rob, I'm from transition wherever. You know, we, we put different hats. So some people are involved in transition and then they take off their transition hat and they put their Extinction Rebellion hat on. And then they might put on their, I'm part of the local government hat on. And then they put their transition hat back on. And we keep swapping that kind of around all the time. I think that uh, uh, often, I think there is a really big conversation happening. I know a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion and other movements who, who are aware that the idea that you just need to write a sufficiently terrifying report and then people are going to support what you, support what you do isn't working. It hasn't worked. It's failed. And actually, if it was going to work, it would have worked in the 1980s and this would have been a lot easier. So I think there are a lot of movements now who are starting to talk about um, uh, imagination and telling a different story. I know there was a beautiful uh, animation that Naomi Klein and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez made in America that was you know, w walking around in the future that we've created. I loved a couple of years ago when Anne Hidalgo, who's the mayor of Paris, ran for re-election on this idea of a 15 minute city. And she, her speech was a kind of storytelling about I'm walking around in, in 10 years time in a 15 minute city in Paris and I can see this and I can hear this. And, and it feels like, a, it feels really important to me because in the 1960s, we had politicians in, in the US and in the UK who talked in terms of visions. We had, I have a dream, Martin Luther King. We had Bobby Kennedy who, who would talk about the future in a kind of a visionary way. We've lost that. And now we just have politicians, supposedly progressive politicians who just talk about little, little steps, little incremental kind of change. And what happens when, when, when we do that is that people on the extreme right will fill the future for us with terrifying things and then position themselves as being the people who will protect us. So I feel like the failure of progressive movements to talk in visions uh, has been really harmful. And it's something that we need to do a lot more of. I also think that actually we need confrontation as well. It's not like we can just do everything with, with cooperation, cooperative approaches. You know, I, I think that the Just Stop Oil uh, the, the, the Sunrise Movement in the US, the Extinction Rebellion, the school strikes, all of those things that are saying this is not acceptable anymore uh, are really important and really valuable. Uh, but I think increasingly those movements are working with such an amazing culture of supporting each other and a really much sort of healthier culture. So yeah, it's we need cooperation, but also the systems that we're up against need to be pushed and we need both of those things i think yes thank you so the next question is about transition movement in asia i try to merge two questions together so so Ling is asking um that it seems that most transition movements you mentioned happened in europe or us are you aware of any movement in asia and if not many in Asia, do you think it's a cultural reason behind that or just a coincidence? And we got another question from Soifa. She's asking whether there is, um, other than Japan, whether you are aware of any transition community in Asia. So yeah, it, I mean, one of the things, one of the things about transition is it's a self-organizing thing. So we, we really designed initially, our initial thinking was the global North, the wealthiest nations in the world are by far way, way, way more responsible for the, for the crisis that we have. And we were inspired by a model called contraction and convergence, which said the global North is up here, the global South is here, the equitable place is here. So we need to get the global North from here 
down to here. And that's only going to happen if that feels like a move towards something rather than being dragged away from something completely uh, irreplaceable. So, we, so initially, we really designed transition as something for Europe, I guess, and America and the kind of rich places that were making all the mess. And so it's been really fascinating to see how it has spread and evolved to different places. Uh, there's lots of transition groups in South America, all the different countries, very vibrant network of transition groups in Brazil and Chile and Argentina, Uruguay, different places. Um, in Asia, as, as the questioner said, there's lots of transition groups in Japan. I think there's about 60 something transition groups across Japan. There's a lot of interest from South Korea um, we get regular um, groups of, of people who come from South Korea to visit Totnes and, and we often uh, I give presentations to things in South Korea. Um, uh, and there have been other bits of, of transition in different places. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's like it doesn't matter if it's called transition, it's a it's an impulse to do things. So in South America, there's also the Buen Vivir movement, there's Via Campesina, these movements that are about alternatives to development. You know, and, and if transition is a useful tool, it's a useful tool. If it's not, you know, you could take bits of it and call it something else. This is not, it's not something that has to be held really rigorously. Um, but I'm sure there have been some transition things that have stuck, that have happened uh, in Hong Kong over the time, but I don't know. I don't know. So it's I offer I offer these tools, and if they feel useful to you, then do make use of them. Yeah, I, I believe there are quite a lot of movement inspired by the transition time movement or transition movement, but just not didn't name itself as a transition movement. This could yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. There's a. There's a. And I, I heard the other day that Shunro, who is what, who is the, uh, who coordinates the Transition Japan hub, has been doing some traveling around in Asia to different countries, and doing doing talks and workshops uh, on on transition there. Um, yeah. And 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 like you say, it really doesn't matter what it's called. And one of the things that we've done recently in Transition Network, which I think we're going to be able to share quite soon, was the latest bit of that sort of mapping but where we tried to understand how this thing spreads and uh by talking to different people in different places so mayors in towns in france and well, how did you hear about transition well i saw this film and then and then because of that we started that and then that inspired and then i met the mayor from this other place and then they started you know to actually try and map that a little bit is really really interesting so there will be lots of things that have taken in, in, inspiration as you say from transition in different ways and it's been absorbed in different ways into things that are happening yes thank you Mark. so since we have only a few minutes more so i would like to put forward this as the last questions so this question is from juliana um she's she would like to know about your will on your experience what is the biggest challenge to transition projects around the world um well, you have engaged different people. So what do the people reflect or share as the biggest challenge which they face? Uh, well, I would say international growth-based capitalism, quite possibly, as a, as a sort of a, this, this monster that just needs to be fed all the time and that has no sense of its limits and has no humility and just sees people and communities and nature as being completely expendable and that we're always working against that sort of um, impulse. Uh, I would say on a, on a local level, I think, you know, the biggest challenge that people have is, is sustaining momentum, you know, because it is hard to, to do this in such a way that you can be resourced properly like they are in Luxembourg. So it's, it's uh, keeping momentum in a group uh, is not that easy. Um, but yeah, I would say, I would say it's, it's the, the fact that we're, that we're pushing against a very powerful current, which seems on the surface at least to be driven by psychopaths and which seems to have no, uh, um, 
no real understanding of of the times that we're in and the urgency of of the challenges and uh yeah and that seems to always be able to evolve and find new ways around things um but so so you know my work is often sometimes i i often get asked you know so are you an optimist or are you a pessimist you know and, and and i always love the word the way that paul hawken answers that question he's an environmentalist he said if you if you read the science about climate change and you're not a pessimist then you haven't read it properly go back and read it again but if you spend any time among the movements around the world that are trying to do something about it and you're not an optimist then you don't have a heart and i i feel like we know the people who are destroying everything and sh completely shameless in doing that and the one thing that i refuse to do is to give them the gift of my despondency of my resignation you know that's just not going to happen and 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 uh it, I think if you if you are an optimist all the time, you're really not paying attention. But if you're a pessimist all the time, you're never going to do anything. So there's a kind of for me, it's like connecting into the stories of that are happening all around the world of what's happening uh, and sharing those stories and being part of something where you can see the world around you changing in a positive way, even if it's just there being a few more fruit trees on the streets that you walk down because you planted them there or that there's things that, that are happening because you made them happen can really, really start to shift uh, our sense of what's possible. And that's a really powerful thing to do, I think. Thank you so much, Rob, for the wonderful sharing tonight. And thank you very much to everyone who put together the questions to make um, such a rich discussion. Thank you so much. Together, I think um, we have co create a very energetic, uplifting, and also very positive forum tonight. Thank you. So to help us to improve the program, um, please respond to our questionnaire, which will be sent to you very shortly. Suggestion of future speakers will also be highly appreciated. I would like to also take this opportunity to invite you joining our next talk. Um, the title is Opening the Heart in Connection with Nature, and the speaker will be Claire Arwa. Um, later, before um, this meeting is closed, you will see, oh, here it is. You will see this screen and there is a QR code there and you can click in to see more information about that. And also a reminder is that please visit our website as we are going to update um, the information of the next series of talks soon. So the last but not the least, I would like to thank for the donation that you have made to keep the Kiduri Earth program running. So once again, thank you so much and wish you all a nice evening or a nice day. And I look forward to see you again in the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Oh, good night. Thank you, everyone.